So again, a big welcome everyone. And I mentioned to uh, everybody right at the beginning, but some of you might have missed it, that Shelley received a positive COVID test result this morning. And they're feeling under the weather, not terrible symptoms, but some symptoms. And Shelly told me to tell everyone that they're modeling wonderful self-care, <laughs> like all of us should. So Shelly will be resting this evening, and I'm here. And uh, especially, as I've said on Sunday morning, some of you maybe even were there for the Sunday morning talk, I wanted to continue that same topic. And it's in some ways, it's a way to cultivate a New Year's resolution. And I'm, I mentioned, I've been mentioning in this talk that, you know, Dharma or Dhamma, as we say in the Pali language, related to the Sanskrit Dharma, which we hear more often in the West. But in the early Buddhist tradition, we use the Pali language, the, script, the scriptures or the discourses of the Buddha were recorded in that other really early Buddhist or early Indian language of Pali, which is very much related to Sanskrit. And uh, Dhamma is like what we're devoted to. We want to wake up to Dhamma. We stabilize, you know, the heart and mind so we can see and touch and relax into and realize the truth of Dhamma the way it is. And it's not easily depictable, you know, like Buddha, we can depict as the person who woke up 2,500 years ago, we have statues or ideas of this person, but Dhamma doesn't really lend itself to a symbol. In early Buddhism, the symbol that they did use was just a simple circle. And it, because it has that sense of wholeness, completeness, but we have clues, right? That's uh, this chant that we went through this evening. Here and now, timeless, encourages investigation naturally, leading to liberation and freedom, the release of the heart, to be done by oneself, no one can do it for us, realizable by the wise. So if you want that, I just put in to the chat there, the link, and it just has the poly words and the simple translation so that you can actually use this as a contemplation. And don't try to do all six, just work with one for a while until these six simple instructions are just nice pointers to keep us in the vicinity of learning, right? We're having insight into Dhamma and we've got six clues. <laughs> Here and now, timeless, courageous investigation. It brings with it energy. As we get closer, there's energy. The heart is enlivened. Can't rely on anybody. Right? We do this work together. We do this very personal work together. That's kind of the, I guess, paradox in a way, it really helps to have community. I don't know, most of you probably know that. And especially wise community, people who are really into the practice, really into the, yeah, that, you know, if I always somewhat joke, if there was some amazing thing, like the thing we really wanted be different for each of us, you know, keys to the perfect cabin or keys to the perfect car or a new cell phone or, spaghetti or <laughs> but but if it was really what we wanted we we'd express some active interest wouldn't we like if you're interested in gold gold and you were pretty sure it was here and now there would be some interest you'd you'd start looking around and so in a sense the buddha and our spiritual ancestors you know we have these teachings that say, you know, there's something that will inspire the heart that's here and now, timelessly here and now, has the emotional or 
psychological flavor of release, of freedom, not being bound up. And it must be done by oneself, experience for oneself. Doesn't matter if all of your friends, all of your trusted folks in your life tell you it's here and now. Doesn't really help me, does it? I have to also experience that it's here and now. And it requires a wise heart, a heart that's actually open, isn't clinging to its ideas about this or that. That, you might guess, that sixth one, in some ways, the hardest. It's hard for us to open to the present moment in a really fresh way. In the same way, and you can just experiment with this at home, some of you have cats, some of you have dogs, some of you have partners, some of you have roommates, so after this program, when you're interacting with, you know, whoever you're living with, even yourself, if you don't, if there's no other living beings in your space or your plant, but it's not, check, it's not that easy to show up in a fresh way. Like we see the plant on the table. Well, I've seen that plant so many times. There's this arrogant and diluted presumption that I already know it. So I don't have to be fresh. I don't actually have to open to my roommate because the idea I have dominates the heart and mind. And, and that way we're always apart, separate. And then our relationships with whatever aren't very satisfying because we're cultivating unaware, unconsciously, we're cultivating distance. We're having a relationship with our idea of our partner or our idea of our cat, not actually that living dance of relating. We just don't trust the present moment enough to show up fully. And we have to undo that habit. It's really the heart of the practice. And I'm sure, as you might expect, one of the main problems is we have a real devotion to our thoughts. It's so compelling. And the thing about our thoughts about the world and our thoughts about our roommate and our thoughts about our cat or dog and thoughts about our body and our thoughts about our world, our thoughts about things, our ideas about things, concepts, they're more orderly than reality. <laughs> so when we're not wise and not really present, we're always going to choose our thoughts or ideas over reality because our thoughts and ideas, even if they're messy, they're just more orderly than reality. But they're always, you know, identifying, imagining that our thoughts are more than what they are is always going to leave the heart feeling distant, hungry in a way. And here's the real kicker. Here's what really breaks our heart wide open. We feel that existential distance or separation, alienation, right? In little ways, in big ways, some periods of in our lives, it's really like an overwhelmingly unpleasant feeling. Other times, you know, it can be more distant. We have it better hidden, let's say, suppressed it in one way or another. But we have that existential uneasiness, that alienation. And so what do we do? We don't really step back and understand what the problem is. We just try harder at what's not working. Right? We try harder to connect with our ideas of the way it is, instead of being more real and more intimate with the wildness of the present moment of our relationships and learning how to relate to that chaos or wildness or present moment reality. It's like even, you know, just having some sense of sitting here now, listening to me and seeing your screen, maybe those of you who are looking at the screen. You can see that all it takes is a few moments, a few seconds 
of not replacing the thought, the idea of what's happening with the previous one. I mean, not replacing the previous one with the new one, right? And we get into that more simple and raw and undefined and alive present moment. It doesn't take, it's never far away. This is that statement that it's timeless. It's not far away. That's real. That's a really useful pointing out. It saves the heart so much neurotic work thinking that I'm here diluted and I need to get to the top of the mountain where I'll be undiluted. I'm here suffering. I'm a suffering being and I want to get to that place where I'm the perfect, perfectly free, perfectly loving, perfectly woke, perfectly appropriate human being. And it just feels like it's, it's a total setup. It just allows us to continue to judge ourselves or hate ourselves or think somebody's better than us or think we're better than. It just generates more and more conceit, whatever the particular flavor of the conceit, better than, worse than, even I'm the same as. But all of these are just expressions of alienation, being apart, disconnected. And there's really no way out of this habit except to understand it. One of my teachers, Saida Utejaniya, says, if you do not look after your garden, it will overgrow with weeds. If you do not watch your mind, defilements will grow and multiply. The mind does not belong to you, but you are responsible for it. And I know that sounds a little paradoxical, like if the mind is a mess and it's not really me, why do I have to be aware of it? Because the mind, the momentum of the mind, the force of habit in the mind is taking the mind, doing the same thing, getting the same results. And this is what we call samsara, the endless cycling of samsara the endless cycling of doing what we've done before in one fashion or another and getting the result, which is tension. Psychological, emotional tension, existential tension, spiritual tension, physical tension, they're all interrelated. And we keep doing the same things. And even when we have some sense, this isn't working, my life isn't working, I got to do something different. The momentum to do something like we've done before is very strong. Let me think about this again. <laughs> Let me worry about this again. Let me wish it weren't this way again. If only I weren't such a bad human being, you know, a bad meditator, then if only I try harder but we try hard at the same thing. So what Saida Utejaniya, this Burmese monk, um, one of my teachers, he says, it does not matter whether thinking stops or not. It's more important that you understand whether the thoughts are skillful, unskillful, appropriate or inappropriate, necessary or unnecessary. We just need to study the present moment which what's often most relevant about the present moment is the activity of the heart and mind. Another place he said, trying to create something, like when you, you're here and you're trying to make something happen in your sit, like get some calm or get some concentration, trying to create something means greed is at work. So when you're striving, what you want the practice to reflect back, oh, greed is at work. This is greed being known. And he goes on, he says, rejecting something means aversion is at work. Like you really want, the mind is just spinning and you really want it to stop. Then what the practice does, what wisdom does is understands, oh, aversion is at work. Wanting this 
crazy mind, this thinking mind to stop is aversion. It's like this. So practice isn't about fixing the mind. Practice is about understanding the way it is. Practice isn't about fixing anything. It's about understanding the way that it is, getting intimate. And it takes a lot of compassion, a lot of kindness, self-compassion, a lot of patience. It takes a real sense of humor. <laughs> I mean, in, a, in the best sense of the word, a real sense, like when we can laugh at the habits of the mind, this is actually one of the places where spiritual community sangha really helps. Having a group of friends who have been doing some semblance of this practice. So in sharing your practice, and hopefully we'll, we'll have a good 20 to 30 minutes tonight to share with each other and to laugh like, oh yeah, this is how it is. This is how the mind works. And not because that laughter really is a reflection of understanding anatta, that impersonal nature. Like uh, Saida said, you know, the mind doesn't belong to us, but we're responsible because thinking I'm not responsible means we're destined for whatever habits there are in the mind to express themselves, triggering the same reaction, triggering more of the same doing what we've done before, getting the results we've gotten before. So trying to create something means greed is at work. Trying to stop something or reject something means aversion is at work. And here's the third, not knowing when something arises and passes away. Not knowing what the mind is knowing means delusion is at work. You know, we might be feeling fine. You know, we're not stressed out. The mind's not sort of in really toxic territory. And we might think, yeah, I'm doing okay. But what wisdom will know in that moment, present moment awareness with some wisdom will reveal, oh, that's delusion. Like even like living as if the present moment doesn't matter, being interested in the present moment doesn't matter. That's delusion at work. Just like unconsciously you know, like not feeling comfortable and constantly adjusting our body. Just because we don't realize that there's irritation and aversion doesn't mean there isn't aversion at work. It's just in that moment unrealized. And then when mindfulness comes back online, oh, this is aversion. Not liking the sensations in the body is like this. This is aversion. It's just aversion, just that pattern. And there's some real freedom in a way, this is the best way to understand what the freedom that the Buddha pointed to. You and I, we're going to have desires, the desire to get rid of what's unpleasant, the desire to gravitate towards what's pleasant. There's just no way to be a living being without desire. I sometimes, just to kind of make this point, I sometimes refer to this truth of desire that desire is the same as life energy. So what characterizes life in its essence is this river of desiring, this, un, this unending desiring. This is what life is. Whether we're talking about a little amoeba, microscopic creature, or we're talking about an elephant, or we're talking about a human being, it's desiring. And where suffering comes in, and, and you know, with that will be the ordinary pain that comes with being a living being. But where real spiritual, moral suffering comes in is when the heart doesn't understand that desiring is just desiring. It starts to per wrongly personalize this river of desiring, this endless desiring. And because it's understood as personal, in other words, the desiring, the force, that river of desiring refers back to this idea that there's a permanent me that is desiring, then all ki kinds of, you know, psychological, emotional, spiritual, psychic suffering begins to happen. Because of that misunderstanding, 
And if the basic problem of human suffering, I'm not saying that injustice isn't a cause for suffering. I'm just saying that injustice has causes. Being mean has causes. Being greedy, being aversive has causes. And the Buddha looked into his own heart and he figured out what the causes are. Wrong understanding or wrong view, which, you know, there are different ways we can talk about it, but thinking that everything, every experience refers back to a separate me, I, me, or mine. So if that's in fact, the Buddha is pointing out, if that's in fact true, then the, the resolution is to see things as they are. Mean, meaning that Buddha, you know, this capacity to be awake, needs to wake up to Dhamma the way it is. And that's our refuge. That's the refuge. That's like at the, basically in every culture, every place that Buddhism has spread, from the time of the Buddha on down, the way you become a Buddhist, which just means you're not actually a Buddhist, there's no such thing as a Buddhist, there are people who are interested in Dhamma, right? The Buddha didn't use the word Buddhist, of course. There are people who are interested in Dharma the way it is. And so we're Dharma practitioners. We are practicing to wake up to Dharma. And so we're cultivating Buddha, this capacity to be awake, so we can be awake to Dhamma. We can see the way it is. And when Buddha is intimate with Dhamma, then our expression, like how we relate, how we act, choices we make, that becomes Sangha. As much as we like to refer to the common ground community as Sangha, we're not really Sangha unless some of us, at least in moments, to some degree, are expressing like the activity of our thoughts and words and actions are coming out of that intimacy of Buddha knowing Dhamma. Then how we act, how we think, how we speak is really appropriate and beautiful in both ordinary and extraordinary ways because it's really coming out of the heart, not being intimate in a moment, but having some continuity. And you can check this out. Like I was saying earlier, if you're going to hang out with your dog or cat or roommate or partner or friend later, you know, instead of trying to be a good friend or trying not to blow it, <laughs> which generally will make us tight, right? Just be Buddha being intimate with Dhamma. Just in this humble way, practice really being open and feeling what we're feeling, sensing what we're sensing, seeing what's being seen, hearing what's being heard. Don't try to be a good human being. Try to be profoundly present, intimate, relaxed with everything, with the wildness or chaos or whatever you want to call it of the present moment. And you might just discover that you turn out to be a really good friend to your cat, to your dog, to your partner, to your roommate, to your friend, to your plants, <laughs> to the world in that moment, in those moments. Otherwise, uh, the description I really like, I came, I heard it at least from Carol Wilson. This is a long time ago, more than 20 years ago. Carol gave this talk and then transcribed it. I don't know if you know Carol Wilson. I sometimes teach with Carol, but she was also uh, an important teacher of mine because uh, Carol taught some of the three-month retreats that I did back in the 90s at Insight Meditation Society. And uh, so she's one of the elders in our Insight Meditation community. And she gave this wonderful example, like to talk about if we uh, sort of approaching to the, the problem of human existence our personal existential existence, as if we're just, we're there in prison, we sort of know we're in prison, that we're caught, that we're suffering, that we're not, you know, really don't know what we're doing, but we need to do something to address the dis-ease in my heart, 
So what do I do? And she gives the simile of rearranging our furniture. We're still in the prison cell, still caught in our habits, really know we're stuck, but really want to do something. So we endlessly re rearrange the furniture in our prison cell. And, you know, it kind of works a little bit, right? It feels a little more fresh. <laughs> but then, you know, it's pretty stale after a little bit because it's the same furniture in the same place. Nothing's really changed. So we try again. And we try harder to re rearrange the furniture. You know, we'll try anything. And we get always a little bit of a hit from that neurotic activity, but no real release. And what the Dharma is, is like getting interested in being in the prison cell. And what's meant by that, that a lot of the initial work we do in our practice is we open to the body. Well, what do we feel when we feel the body? We feel the cumulative effects of having been neurotic for, in my case, 63 years. And so all of that has been laid down in the body. So when I open to the body, I feel physical tension. I feel old ancient patterns of holding tension in this way and that way. I feel numbness in all those places in my body where I've practiced not being aware. So I have chronic unawareness, which we feel as a kind of blankness or numbness in our body. And it takes a long time of being with the body, which is mostly being felt as the result of tension before we have moments, more and more moments of feeling the body that is empty of that kind of tension. It's like open space or energy, unrestricted energy. And it's the same with being aware of the activity of the heart, the sort of more subtle emotional quality of the heart, as well as the mental activity. So there is this legacy, let's call it, of our human ignorance, our neurotic tendencies. So when we first open, we have to be really patient, fearless. We need that sense of humor. We need spiritual friends who tell us, yeah, that's how it is. Don't give up, keep at it. Because there's something here and now, it's timeless. It's energizing. There's some energy there that will draw you in. And you get that taste of liberation, of freedom. You'll sense that the practice, that opening is in the direction of release, not in the direction of entanglement. You'll see that you can do it. Only you can do it. And it's realizable when the mind, when the heart is open, not when it thinks it knows. <laughs> but when it's really just to be intimate, to be open. So I want to save some time for discussion. Yeah, just I'll start with the comment that Roseanne put in. Well, maybe I'll start with uh, Cameron's comment here. It's not that we are in prison. We are the prison. The prison is a delusion. Yeah, but the prison's a prison until we understand something about the prison. And it doesn't matter if it's mind created or not. What matters, like we always have to start with reality, which is the body's tight. And it's like this. Because the Buddha wasn't interested in giving the um, metaphysical truth of our existential situation. I mean, he does to some degree but he mostly was interested in what do you need to do? Then let's do it. So that the basic instruction is to learn how to be close. To do that, we need to stabilize our lives. We need to start acting in more generous, kind ways. We need to avoid causing ourselves and others harm because it settles us down. When I'm being mean, when I'm mistreating others, when I'm being stingy, and then I try to open to my existential situation, I can't because my mind is haunted by living in an unhelpful way. So even though I like what Cam wrote there, and I think it points to, it can be useful. 
um, the prison that we experience is as real as anything is real. So that's the point is we wanna get close to the way it is because it's only when we're willing to be close, to be relaxed and clear and settled that the heart realizes there's nothing to grasp, not even freedom. We don't grasp freedom. We don't grasp suffering. But the way, the means to do that is to open. And then this brings us to Roseanne's question, talk more about the meaning of timelessness. Remember these, these uh, phrases that are about like our devotion to the present moment or devotion to the way it is. They're also like something to chew on or to contemplate. So we like throw that in, oh, it's timeless. It's here and now and it's timeless. So I can relax. So even if I blow it, you know, and I think about the news or I think about this or that, instead of spending time, oh, I really blew it. No, no, it's here and now. It's still here. It's still available. I can't really blow it. I don't have to worry. There's an image that Ajahn Amro used that I think just helps us understand our practice generally, which is when you're in the passenger seat of a car and it's driving along the road, instead of thinking that I'm here moving through space and time, we can have the sense that the space of the present moment and the scenery, the landscape is moving through the space of the present moment. And that gives us a sense of timelessness, that the space of awareness is here and now. And in this vast, empty, mirror-like space of the present moment, all of the causes and conditions of our lives come and go. Hell and heaven, sorrow and beauty, subtle and gross, the whole dance, thoughts about the Dharma, thoughts about sex and everything in between. It all just in here in the space of the present moment. So that timelessness can sort of help point the heart so that it learns to trust the space of here and now. It's a way of evoking a sense of trust in the space of here and now. Because relaxation is really important. Like if we're really gonna understand the way it is, the mind has, has to take a non-interfering, has to be relating with non-interference. As long as I'm trying to do something, trying to figure something out, trying to get something or get somewhere, the mind can't really see the way it is. It can't go from misperception to clear seeing. So to go from the habits of misperceiving, like thinking that we're in a prison, to really understanding the way it is, we have to really relax. And timelessness, that teaching, it's a teaching. It isn't a metaphysical truth as much as it's a useful phrase for the heart to chew on, to get us a little closer to what's here and now. To, to sort of, you know, each of these instructions is a counterweight to delusion. So again, this kind of goes back to my comment about what Cam said. The Buddhist teachings aren't metaphysical truths. They're counterweights to the habits of delusion, the habits, what we call wrong view, wrong understanding. So like when we hear it's here and now, it's a counterweight to thinking that it's out there somewhere. I'm here deluded and I need to get to this place called enlightenment. Anybody know the way? So then we hear, oh, it's here and now. I, I've had teachers tell me that when I, in, in retreats, you know, hey, it's already here. 
those are very useful instructions because I was sort of the striver, you know, I was going to work harder than anybody else. And so it was really helpful when the teacher would say, hey, Mark, it's already here. You know, it's already here, right? It's already here. That was a really useful instruction as a counterweight to some of my habits of mind. Same with timelessness is a counterweight to some of our habits of mind. Same with that's it's enlivening is a counterweight to seems boring. Well, maybe what's boring is the idea that I'm here practicing and nothing's happening. There is no thought that's more boring than sitting in meditation thinking nothing's happening. That's a very boring thought to have over and over again. And, and then the mind is looking at the thought, yeah, nothing's happening. Well, of course nothing's happening because all you're doing is thinking the thought, nothing's happening. I mean, that is something happening, but it's not enlivening. What's enlivening is to realize, oh, that's just a thought. And that thought is an amazingly ephemeral. It was there and now it's not there anymore. Unless the mind recreates it. And there, oh, look at it, it's there again. That's amazing too. It died and then took rebirth. Yeah, other questions? You can go ahead and either raise your digital hand or <clears throat> small enough crowd, you could just unmute yourself, say your maybe your first name. If you want, you could share your pronouns. Anybody have any comments or questions? Yeah, Roseanne. I just unmuted myself. Can you hear me okay? Sure can. I'm just gonna, the thought is on my mind, so I'll just put it out there. Um, I feel like I'm, my practice right now is so much about understanding or, or being in the present moment. Seeing, being, see, seeing things as they are. And, and I know that is this like, is, is the next step or do, is there a natural progression that tells me how to act out of that knowledge? In other words, how do I live my life knowing that I'm, once I feel like maybe I'm in the present moment or I'm conscious of the present moment and the way it is, or do we not, if we, are we, are we trusting the fact that our actions draw out of that um, skillful place to be? That we, yeah. we, that we arrive at by, by understanding that we're in the present moment. Yeah, good, good comment question, Roseanne. Yeah, I, basically we have to look at our actions in the world, how we're relating, how we're showing up, <clears throat> how resilient the heart is, but not day by day because the change doesn't happen that quickly. It's really, I think you might've heard because um, both Shelley and I have used this uh, simile from the Buddhist teachings of the axe handle. And it's really a useful little simile. You know, these similes are so useful because we, we remember them easily. And so the, the basic story is there's no way day by day we can tell that we've worn down an axe handle. Even if we used it all day long, we can't tell the difference between this morning and this evening on the ax handle. But if we've used it every day for 20 years, we can tell that ax handle as worn down. And I just find that a very useful thing because it keeps us from neurotically checking. How do I know if I'm living more and more out of the present moment? Well, after a couple of years, we can just get a sense, oh, if this had happened a couple of years ago, I'm guessing my reaction would have been really different than right now. So that's one way to reflect on your question, Roseanne, is taking the longer view, like how I respond, how I relate, how I react, has it changed? Am I reacting with as much anger, as much, as much greed, as much distraction and delusion as I did 5, 10, 15 years ago, or even a couple of years ago? But the other thing is, we always want some humility, like in terms of what you said at the beginning of your comment, 
because it can seem like I'm really trying hard to be aware of the present moment, be intimate with the present moment, but we want to always infuse our practice with humility, like uh, the mind, the thinking mind can be very deceptive. So we can be thinking the thought that I'm practicing, but not really practicing. We're thinking the thought that we're practicing. Now, I bet if, I don't know if people are looking at gallery view, but put your thumb up or raise your hand. If you caught yourself, like if you work with mindfulness of breathing, it's very common to catch the mind thinking of breathing in and breathing out, but not really at all aware of the physical experience of the breath and the body. But we thought we were aware of the breath, but actually the mind was just imagining, even visualizing breathing in and breathing out, but not aware that it was just thought or visualization. It's not bad or wrong to think about breathing in and breathing out, but it's diluted when you're thinking about breathing in and breathing out, but imagining that you're actually with the experience, the physical experience of breathing in and breathing out. And so this is often, I mean, just going back to what I said earlier in the evening, to be hanging out with your partner or your cat or your whatever friend, thinking that you're really there with them, only to realize that you're just in your thoughts about the relationship. Like your, your friend is talking, but you've reacted to something they've said, and you're kind of caught up in your idea of who they are because they said that, and you've stopped listening. You've stopped really being there as a human being in relationship with this other human being in that wild way that relationships are. So we want a lot of humility. And then the last thing I want to say about Roseanne's comment is, and this is related to humility, if we're really humble, then we're willing to sustain that present moment awareness. So we have the sense that we're being present. We really want to connect with reality, the present, the way it is. Then humility and persistence mean that we have some continuity. And that's when we really start to experience the wildness, the mystery, the, yeah, the sort of the, the deepening of learning is when we have continuity with present moment awareness, whether it's with the breath or just generally with whatever's predominant in the moment. Thanks for getting us started. Scott, I see that you've unmuted yourself. Oh, uh, yeah. <clears throat> Um, this is Scott, and I was uh, interested in the uh, notion of timelessness as well. It, um, not that long ago, the uh, impermanence, uh, you know, entered uh, my thinking, and uh, uh, you know, the impermanent nature of uh, nature and all that's around us. So I'm curious about a connection between timelessness and impermanence uh, or how, you, how, how uh, uh, those uh, two can work together. Yeah, <laughs> that's a great question, Scott. Yeah, and, and, and of course the real answer is like, because the question is so good, uh, like, you know, that, that phrase encourages investigation. I don't know if other people felt this when Scott was sharing, but, you know, uh, being a sincere practitioner, I think I can give myself that. Then I, as he was talking, I was reflecting on my experience. Like, what is the connection between the timelessness of here and now and the groundlessness, the impermanent nature of what's here and now, right? And it was like, I experienced like, oh, this is awe-inspiring. You know, the Dhamma, the Dharma is awe-inspiring. I felt the energy rising in my experience, just listening to the question and reflecting directly on my experience, using Scott's question as a, as a way to get interested, to connect, to be intimate with my experience. 
And so the point I want to make is let's use that question and, and look, you know, not just right now, but forever and see what is the relationship between the timelessness and the groundlessness of impermanence, the, the sort of ephemeral, insubstantial, unreliable, changing, uncertain nature of sight, of sound, of thought, of sensation, of every aspect of experience. The world is insubstantial, it's changing, and there's something that's timeless. So one way just conceptually to talk about that might help you get close is when we look at our subjective experience as a human being, it can be reduced always to two things. And this for me has been one of the most powerful pointing out, meaning I use it as a reflection to support being intimate with reality. And the two things we can always reduce any moment of life to is something an object of experience is being known. And you can't separate these two things exactly, but when we open to the present moment, we can either notice this is being known, or we can notice this is being known. We can highlight is being known, or we can highlight the object that is being known. And the being known is more the timeless, end of the equation, Scott. And the object is the ephemeral part of the equation. Does that make sense? Because objects come and go. Sensation isn't substantial. Even when we feel like we have chronic pain, like it's not changing, when we really relax and get actually interested, we'll notice that that throbbing pain is a river of change, a changing river of sensation. It isn't a static thing. Same with sound, same with sight, same with thought, same with emotion. There really isn't anything static, any object of experience that's static. But the knowing has this timeless quality to it. It doesn't mean that awareness is me in any essential way. The Buddha was very clear that knowing awareness, whatever you want to call it, is not self, is not personal. But it has this space-like, timeless nature. And it's really nice to use that as a support for getting really intimate and for basically we're setting up the heart that lets go. We're cultivating a way of being, a way of relating that leads to the letting go of everything that can be let go of. The free fall of the heart, or as it's said in the suttas, the unshakable release, the heart's sure release. Those are two ways it gets translated. I love both of them. The heart's sure release and the unshakable release of the heart. Is that helpful, Scott? You're muted, Scott. Anything you want? Yeah, you have to unmute yourself. Sorry. Oh, Could you st I, start I over? Think, yeah, I think very helpful, but I'm not sure. Um, so I, to me, that feels like your la what you expressed near the end felt like uh, leads to acceptance in a way. Yeah, because the reality of the present moment will have its effect on the heart. Remember that same thing about the ax handle, the other simile the Buddha uses, I, I use it a lot. So I'm, I'm sure a lot of you have heard this is you take a boat that's been out in the oceans and then in the rainy season, you pull it up into dry dock and it just sits there in the rain and the wind and the sun and all the riggings and sails wear, wear out. So the Buddha used that as a simile so we're wearing, the practice is wearing out wrong view. That's what we're doing. And that allows the heart 
to accept. We're wearing out all of the habits of reactivity, all the reactivity that we'd characterize as greed, all the reactivity we'd characterize as fear and aversion, and all the reactivity that we'd characterize as distraction, denial, disconnection. We're wearing out those habits. Freedom is what's left. Letting go is what's left. So it isn't even, I got to learn to let go as much as it is, I need to wear out the habit of clinging and grasping and reacting. And how do we wear it out? We shine the light of awareness on it. We see, oh yeah, this is clinging. This is grasping. This is non-acceptance, like you said. This isn't helping. Yeah, thank you, Scott. Thank you. Very much. I appreciate it. Yeah, we have time for at least one more comment. Reflections from your own practice you want to share. Of course, questions also okay. What comes to mind? And if people have uh, interest in this topic, you might check out Sunday's talk. It's on our YouTube channel. And this talk will probably go there too. And then that was just the first half of this talk. So you can get a sense of what was covered in case it wasn't that clear. Any closing thoughts for the group, anybody? Well, let's take a moment then and Send Shelly some healing wishes. You can visualize them and feel our heart opening. And of course, it isn't just Shelly. There's so many people that all our medical workers stressed out, burnt out from so many months, all the other sick people, much worse conditions, and all the people affected in so many different ways. Holding this tender world with joys and its sorrows in our heart. We learn how to be open to the whole range of human experience, including our own. May all beings be at ease in this changing, uncertain world. May we all learn how to show up with real kindness, fearless compassion, and with ease. And really nice being with everyone. I'm not positive that Shelly's planning to do the half day retreat this Saturday. I think it starts at 9.30 to one or nine o'clock to one. You can sign up for that uh, through the public calendar, online calendar. And if you know anybody who's interested in introduction class, I'm going to, both Shelly and I are going to be teaching this next one. We'll share some of the weeks. Um, and that's six Tuesdays beginning next Tuesday, which maybe is the 11th of January. And then Monday night, we start the next Buddhist studies course, uh, eight Mondays, and we're learning the four Brahma Viharas, the divine abodes of equanimity, appreciative joy, compassion, and kindness. So join in for any of that. And Mesky and Shelly and I are going to be doing a class or a workshop rather on the 22nd Saturday um, on the Four Noble Truths. So consider that as well. Feel free to unmute yourselves and say good night if you'd like. Thank good you. Everyone. Everyone. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Mark. Mm -hmm. Bye. Thank, Thank you so much, Mark. Good night. Yeah. Bye. Good night. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thanks all. Thank you, Mark.